Hello and welcome to our second section. Um, I want to uh, present the Foskis Social Club uh, first in the English language. Everything okay? Can mute it. Okay, so the technical difficulties are away, I hope so. Okay, uh, the, the Foskis uh, Social Club is um, the German chapter of the OSGEO and OSM. Um, we uh, make this conference together with uh, the Froscon team here uh, with the uh, OSGEO and OSM track. Um, now we have uh, a talk uh, from uh, Hartmut Holzgräfe. Uh, I saw his talks last year here also uh, at the Frostcon, so he's maybe the uh, oldest <laughs> presenter <laughs> uh, here at the uh, Geo talk uh, at Frostcon. Uh, yeah, but now have a nice talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, my name is Hartmut, we already know that. <laughs> and I'm living in Bielefeld here in Germany, really. <laughs> and I studied uh, electric engineering and computer science and doing OpenStreetMap since almost uh, 10 years now. So next weekend it's going to be 10 years for me. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and in my primary job, I do not really work with uh, geodata or maps or stuff. Uh, I am a database support engineer for MariaDB and formerly for MySQL. So I'm usually doing the boring database stuff in my day job. And try to do other things on the side, like what we have now. <laughs> so I'm going to have two talks today. And this one is describing the basics I learned while working on the application that I will present in the second one in the afternoon about printable OpenStreetMap, for which this big printer here is hopefully being operational in the afternoon. And so, what is MapMic? For this we have the usual computer science diagram. We have some big box in the middle. <laughs> we have input coming in and output coming out. And some configuration coming from the side. And some code that is controlling what is happening. And MapMic is actually a library that sits in the middle and that is processing map data and is <laughs> converting it into pretty pictures. That's yeah, the simple story. <laughs> so for this MapNet can read several different uh, kinds of input, like uh, shape files, which is a specific format for geodata. And it can read uh, geodata that comes from SQL databases. It has native drivers for Postgres and for spatial light. Losing the microphone. <laughs> and, and it also has support for other database via uh, a special extra plugin library. You can natively read uh, GeoJSON. And it can also read a lot of other formats via two extra plugins, one using the OGR library that is supporting both vector and raster images. So this can be used, for example, to read raw OSM data and GPX files. There is GDAL that is only there to read raster images and display pre-rendered images that you want to embed in a map. And on the other side, we have different output formats that we can support. That is, we can produce PNG files, 
both full color files or reduced color 8 bit files to make the files a bit smaller, as maps usually don't have that many colors. We can produce JPEG. We can produce scalable vector graphics. That's especially interesting if you want to uh, create a map and then use that in a graphics program like Inkscape or like in Adobe tools to then add more stuff to it. We can produce printable PDF right away and also still can produce printable PostScript where that is still needed. Whereas PostScript and PDF are sort of similar. And so we have our input on the one side that goes in, and on the other side we want to have pretty pictures. So we need the third thing, and that is the render styles that tell the Mapnik library how to take the input data and transform it into pretty pictures. And for this we can either do define render styles directly in the programming code, or we can use external XML style files that describe how we want our stuff rendered. And both have their advantages and disadvantages that we will see later. And there are also some other style sheet languages that can be converted into the Mapnik XML format like uh, Carto CSS, for example, that is used for the main OpenStreetMap style that are a bit more readable than the XML format. <laughs> so, and Mapnik itself is not a standalone program, it is a library. So we need at least a little bit of extra code around it to make a full rendering application. And the library itself is written in C++. And then there is Python bindings, so that you do not you have to use C++ code directly, but can use it in, in Python programs, which is usually going to be easier. And we also have experimental bindings for PHP, which I've found just lately and haven't tried yet, so <laughs> can't really tell how good that works yet. But, so this talk is only about the Python bindings. And few things we need to start is that we obviously need Python, and it works both with Python 2 and 3, but some features may only be in the latest version that only works with 3. We also have two different versions of Mapnik, version 2 and version 3, that is not related to the Python versioning, it's just also 2 and 3 by coincidence. And we had Python bindings in Mapnik 2 included in the main Mapnik source code. And now with Mapnik 3, it's two separate uh, projects, or two separate repositories. You have the main library in C++, and then you have a second project that does the Python bindings. But usually you don't really have to care about it like on Debian or Ubuntu, you just install Python Mapnik and that pulls in all the other things that are needed. And there's still a to-do item here on the slides because I did not test it in other platforms. I know that on macOS, the, all the stuff is in the homebrew system. I know that there are Windows packages somewhere, but I don't know anything about Windows, so <laughs> I have no idea how to install it there. And so what Mapnik does on the input side is that all the input front ends we have deliver just four data types to the actual library. And that is points, that's points of interest that have some attributes. That is lines, like for example a street. That's polygons, that is all kinds of areas like land use areas or the shape of a building. So everything that is a closed line that actually defines an area is a polygon. And there's also the possibility to import images that are already pre-rendered. Like for example, this is used in some OpenStreetMap online maps to include 
uh, hide information by making one side of a mountain a bit darker to have a pseudo uh, 3D effect. That is done not by MapNik itself, but by using pre-rendered images that have this height uh, sh uh, shadow simulation data pre-rendered as a big TIFF file. And this is not necessarily the data format that data is in the actual input files. Like when we use raw OSM files, the input format is different. So the input layer has to convert it into these formats. And each of these objects can also have additional information. Not only the geom geometry information, but also different attributes that can be used to decide what gets rendered and how it gets rendered. Like in the most basic case, almost every object that we're going to render is going to have a name. And this name can be used in style rule to say, I want the name displayed here. We also see that later. Oh, wrong button. <laughs> so then we have the style definition in, in MapNik. That again consists of three different basic kinds of objects. The first is what is called the layer. So the layer defines what data we want to use and what style or what multiple styles we want to use to display the data. And the style can filter, like it can say I only want to, I want to take the input data but I only want to render the stuff, the things that have a name or that have a certain size or whatever attributes you have. And then it uses what's called symbolizers. That is the, uh, the mapping components that do the actual drawing of, of things. So we have four basic types of symbolizers that, is, that directly map to the four basic kinds of objects. That is point symbolizer, line symbolizer, polygon symbolizer, and raster symbolizer. And these are pretty easy, like the point symbolizer either just draws a little square, or you can, oh, that's <laughs> or you can give it the name of a, a symbol file you want to render. Similar for the line symbolizer that just gets the information what how thick you want to draw your line, what color you want to draw a line in, and you have some basic options like you can have a dotted line, uh, describe, I want the dots in this size and the gaps in this size. Polygon symbolizer just takes an area and fills it with a solid color, and the raster symbolizer just takes the input raster image, maybe resizes it, but otherwise just puts it directly into the output without modifying it. And then we have more complex ones. There is marker symbolizer that can put markers on a line. Like when you have a one-way street, you can put the little arrows as marker on the line to show that you can only use it in that direction. We have what's called the line pattern symbolizer. No, oh, spelling error, it's pattern, not, not pattern. And um, that can be used to draw little symbols, symbols on the side of a line, like when you have an, an edge in the landscape where the landscape goes down. You have these little triangles in usual map styles that are at the side of the line. These can be drawn using a line pattern symbolizer. Then there is a very important thing, the text symbolizer that is, as the name says, used to show text. And it's usually it uses the name attribute or whatever you have in your data that gives the name for an object, and then puts that on the symbol. And that can be used for points, for lines, and for polygons. For points, it will just put the text next to the point. For lines, it will put the text along the line. And for polygons, you will just try to find the middle of the polygon and put it there. And depending on how complex your shape is, that can be perfectly fine or perfectly 
somewhere where you don't expect it. Like if you have like a half moon, the text will not be in that half moon shape, but it will in the middle of the circle that would be the full moon. And then there is a special kind of a marker symbolizer that is the shield symbolizer. Using the microphone again. <laughs> okay, so the shield symbolizer is used mostly for uh, highway numbers. So that's why it's called shield symbolizers because on US maps these are usually shown in little shields. So what the shield symbolizer does is it has a basic image of, of the shield and then it knows how to extend it to fit the number of the text you want to display in it. So if you have a one di digit number it's small, two digit, three digit, it automatically gets wider. And then the final one we have is polygon pattern symbolizer <coughs> that is similar to the basic polygon symbolizer, but it can fill the polygon not only with a uh, solid color, but with a background image. So usually you take a small repeatable image, like for a forest you have green background and one or two trees on it, and then you give the polygon pattern symbolizer the instruction, use this image, just tile it and put it into the polygon until it's fully filled up. Ah, there's a very special one, the building symbolizer. That's a pretty new ex experimental one that draws buildings in sort of a isometric pseudo 3D uh, view. So you have, instead of just a rectangle for a building, you have a little pseudo box that also can take into account the height of the building. So now, let's get to the Python part again. <laughs> this is the very basic use of the Mapnik library. So you have to import it. You have to define a map object and give it a size. And then in the end, you call render to file. For the map you created, give it a file name and a file type, and then a file is written. So this obviously does nothing but it at least creates an empty file <laughs> with transparent background. Not that interesting yet. <laughs> so we add a bit more here. <laughs> so we start by giving the map a, a map a background color, steel blue here. Then we define a polygon symbolizer that also gets a fill color in light green. And we create a rule object. We append the polygon symbolizer to the rule. We create a style object, we append the rule to the style. So the style can have multiple rules that, uh, rules that get stacked while drawing. Like when you want to draw a road, you may first draw a white line, then you draw a slightly smaller line in a different color. So you have a road with a visible edge, and then as a third U rule, you may then put text on top of the rule. Uh, on top of the road to print the road name. Here we only have one rule. So one symbolizer, one rule, one style. We append the style to the map. So now the map object knows there's a rule called countries with the given style, which just creates light green polygons here. And then we create a layer. So that's what combines the data and the style. We call that layer world. And as a dat data source here, we use a shape file. That is a predefined file that has the shapes for all countries in the world. We append that style we defined to the layer. We append the layer to the map. We give the map the instruction to zoom all. That is to zoom far enough that everything in the input file can be seen. And then the end, we render our file again. So, it looks better already. <laughs> we have the blue background, the green foreground. And we didn't give any rule for showing the borders. The borders here are just artifacts 
due to anti-aliasing anti on the edges of the polygons. So by default, it has anti-aliasing enabled. Let's more obviously see the edges here. But you can turn that off, then we would only have the continents in green without borders. So next, let's add a second rule. So we have a polygon symbolizer again. Now, oh. the upper polygon symbolizer is the one we had from the previous code. And now we add a second polygon symbolizer that fills polygons in red. And we add a second rule here called Germany. And for this rule, we define a filter. And that filter is supposed to only render things that have the name Germany. And the name attribute is also set in the shape file we imported. So we append the second rule with the style. And the rest of the code is like the previous one. And uh, something else changed here because really the borders are gone. <laughs> but we see now Germany is not green anymore. Germany is now red. But we also see that we have to write a lot of code here. And so there is the alternative to not do this all in Python code, but to do this in the XML format instead. So we place we replace all the rule and style and layer definitions we had with just a call to load map and give it an XML file to read. Uh, this is what the XML file then looks. This is exactly the same style as before. All countries are filled green. One country is filled red. And we get country information from that country shape file. And so the result is obviously also the same. But even as unreadable as XML sometimes is, I think it's still more readable than this. So the advantage of doing things in Python code directly is that you can change rules dynamically as you go. So in an interactive application where you want users to be able to change styles on the fly, this would uh, take more work, but it would be more flexible, while this is more suitable when you have predefined styles that you do not want to change anymore. So and for the rest of these examples, I will use the XML format just as it is a better fit for the slide size here. So I have a few examples of symbolizers here. I unfortunately, I was not able to finish to copy all of them over because I had a network failure and didn't finish my slides in time. <laughs> Guilty. <laughs> but you, you get the idea. And then the other styles are also described in the MapNIC documentation. And for most of the symbolizers, they're code examples both for XML and for Python. So we only do the very basic things here like uh, the file name is still world XML here, but the contents are different. You're going to see on the next slide. So what we do here is we still zoom into all the data, but the new uh, data file also only has two points in it. And if you would just zoom in on these two points, we have, would have the two points at the edges. And when style as symbols for these two points, you would only see half of the point because the other half would be outside of the image. So we do another zoom call that has a negative zoom factor, so it zooms out, and the factor is 1.1, so we zoom out by 10%, and that is enough to see all the features we want. And that is our style file. We have a a point symbolizer that just shows a point dot a PNG that is a PNG file that just has a filled circle in it. And now as a data source, we do not use the big country shape file anymore, but a small GeoJSON file. And this is the GeoJSON file that we are going to use here. 
It only has two points in it, the different places. And so this is the final map we get with just these two points on it. Obviously not that useful, but as an example how it works, it's the most basic thing, a thing to do. So in real map you would have several stars stacked on each other that would, point, uh, would draw different things to make a complete map. But here we only have two points. And the second example now, eh. this is a bit more complex. Let's maybe see the geo Jason. Ah. Yeah, I told you on the few slides I missed. <laughs> So in this example, we have actually another GeoJSON file that only has a simple line in it. And we use two symbolizers, one line symbolizer that draws a blue line, and one text symbolizer that uses a certain font in a certain size with black color and a white halo around it. We will see what the halo is soon. And so, that's also not fully correct here. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so please ignore the background text there. What it, this style file uh, actually rendered is just the blue line and the text here on top. So the text aligns with the line. And you can see it is black text on blue with a slight white frame around it. And that's the halo. So that is when, ex for example, you have black text on top of something else that is also black. You can still read the text. Yes, so there are other, the other symbolizers I didn't uh, cover in the examples. Could be, we had the polygon symbolizer in the first code example already. Um, I told you about the marker symbolizer that is used for lines with symbols on the side, ah, with symbols on top, shield symbolizer for highway numbers and stuff like that, line pattern symbolizes for lines that have some small, small things on the side, and polygon pattern symbolizer for filling a, like a forest area with a repeated forest background image and the building symbolizer for buildings in a fake 3D. So and all of this we could have done with just a standalone MapNet renderer. Wouldn't really use any need to write our own code for it. But what makes the combination of Python and MapNet interesting is but you can also use other drawing functions to not draw some things around or on top of your map. Like, we can use uh, Cairo graphics and tell MapNake not to render files itself, but we create a PDF service in Cairo uh, here now. So we're going to gen generate a PDF file. And we create what is called a context. Context is what you actually draw into in Cairo. We still create a map of a certain size. We load our style sheet, we zoom in. But now what is different is we do not render to a file right away, but we re render to the surface we define. So we actually render into uh, an image that is controlled by a different library and which we can then still use and change later and that is what we're going here and going to do here. We set the color we want to use to black. We set the line width we want to use to five points. And then we say we want to have a rectangle of a certain size and context stroke is what actually draws the rectangle using the line width and the color we defined. And then in the very end as MapNik doesn't render the file anymore, we tell the Cairo surface that we're finished and that is, it is now supposed to write the PDF file. So the result is we have our two points again here, which are from the map data, and we have the rectangle that is not map data at all, but that we put on top ourselves. 
and you can also use that to not only draw stuff directly, but we can also pretty easily put SVG images on top. So we also need to import the RSVG library here. We draw our map as we did before. Then we read our uh, SVG file here. Set the coordinates where we want to draw it. Uh, this image is actually too large for the map we are going to render. So we resize it so it's, it's all, only half of the size. We render it to the Cairo context that our map data is already in. And again, say finish, write our results out to the file. And so now we get this. We have our two map points again. Now we have the FSVG image that tells us where the north on the map is. And so, as a summary, this is what a complete application looks like that uses all these components to draw a map. So we have the actual map here. We have decorations on the side, on the top, and on the, sorry, on the top and on the bottom. So we have a title on top. We have some copyright notice and other text on the bottom. We have an index on the side. And on top of the map, we have extra SVG markers for the things in the index, like bus stop Weststraße is here in map square C4 at this position. And we have that red circle, which is the you are here marker. And all this was created using the components we've seen in this talk, but in a, in a larger application that I will talk about in the afternoon in more detail. And that's also what the big printer is here for, that is hopefully going to be operational in the afternoon. So if all goes well, if you want to have a map of your neighborhood, we could arrange that in the afternoon during the breaks, not during the talks. <laughs> so, but to summarize uh, this talk, what have you learned or what have I learned in my first adventure into Python land? <laughs> it is, once you've figured out all the ways how not to do it, it is actually pretty simple. You have not seen much code here. And the devil here is in the styles, not in the code. And obviously, as always, in all the details but most of the work is not on the code side, but on the style file side. Uh, the combination of MapNik, uh, Python, and Cairo allows for a very flexible map rendering and putting things around the map on, on top of the map in addition to the actual MapNik rendering. And what I learned personally is the MapNik documentation is not as good as I expected it to be. So there is uh, mostly a wiki on the MapNik Git repository, and it describes all the stuff, but sometimes you only have a header and then just this does this without any further explanation. And what's more annoying is often enough you have this only works with this version. So does it work with the version I have now? If it doesn't anymore, what is the replacement now? You don't really know. You often enough have to find out yourself. So that's it. And I want to give a special thank to our cat Layla, with, uh, which has helped to produce this talk, or <laughs> has not succeeded in preventing me from doing it. <laughs> yeah. So now is the time for questions. Can, can I get some, some style files, some, some predefined style files? For instance, those, those used on the OSM street map things, there are different layer, different uh, style files. Can I download yes, these somewhere in a compatible format? Or? That, yeah, I've uh, set up uh, all the public style files I could get hold of, like the official OpenStreetMap style and the German OpenStreetMap style and stuff like that. But 
that's actually stuff I cover in the other talk in the afternoon. Yes, okay, so and it new is. New sci-fi seems to be a bit time-consuming. <laughs> yes, it is. It is time-consuming to do a style from scratch. So you usually either use one of the normal styles that already exist, like there is a style called OSM Bright, which can be used as a basis to st put your stuff on top, or what I do in that application I'll show in the afternoon is I first use a standard style to render the map, and then use a second style to just put on top stuff I'm really interested in, like uh, hiking routes or uh, firefighter facilities. So that way you don't have to do a style from scratch, but just put on top of existing style what you're interested in. So putting several styles into the same Cairo context is not a problem. Any more questions? Uh, con con can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, concerning style files, uh, Mapnik has its own style file format. Is there an option to have map CSS uh, for definition oh, of styles? No, unf unfortunately, there is no option to have map CSS. Okay. Because I have one style I'd really like to offer in the other application that is oh. only coming with the map CSS style, and there is there are converters for converting uh, Mapnik into map CSS, but mm. not the other way around yet. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, further questions? Ah, okay. Uh, what is the preferred data source you use in your style files? Is it really uh, Postgres or? No, I'm. Um, what I'm actually using and what most of the predefined styles use is actually an uh, OSM to PGSQL import of OSM data into a Postgres database. But I wanted to have standalone examples here that do not need an extra database. That's why I used GeoJSON here to have something small, self-contained. But I guess that's not really feasible for like no. larger Germany no. or Europe no. or something. No. no. All right. <laughs> Additional questions? No, I don't see. Okay, so at first, thank you. Good for the great talk. <laughs>